And howdy, everyone. Welcome to the next installment of The Republic, The Seven-Headed Beast. This one, we are going to be covering The Republic to Empire, part three of The Republic, The Seven-Headed Beast. In part two of this series, we examined how the various states of ancient Rome united and threw off the monarchy, established a government, quote, of the people that decided how to rule after adopting a supreme, quote, law of the land in the 12 tables of law. We also discussed how Roman society was divided into two castes, the patricians and plebeians, while always expanding territory in order to expand wealth and resources. In part three, we will discuss how this system was exploited, political allies made and broken, until the main driving force behind this effort, Julius Caesar, was made dictator for life. The start of the Republic hatching from its chrysalis into the empire of Rome. Iulius Kaiser was born into a patrician family, the Gens, or clan, Uliae, family Caesares, which, or however, the family was not wealthy. He could, uh, he would accrue massive debt on his quest, his quest for power, that is. Early on, Iulius, or Julius, aligned himself with the plebeian class, i.e. blue-collar Romans. This is a time when the nobility of being a patrician was fading, wealth and power beginning to occupy a stronger position uh, and influence. In classic Greco-Roman tradition, the Iulii Casares traced their lineage back to the goddess Venus. As with any political position, a person had to work their way up through the ranks of lower magistrate offices. Ultimately, to reach the top, one had to win or be appointed as governor over a province. The position of provincial governor led to great power and wealth. If one was able to assert the necessary military dominance over the region, the nobility had alienated the peasantry or working class so as so to have a humble patrician such as Julius working his way through the ranks helped him to garner the respect of the plebeians. <clears throat> Establishing himself well and spending what little Casares' fortune he did have on making powerful political connections with the elite of Rome, Julius formed the first triumvirate, a political coalition of leaders ostensibly answering to the Senate. He was then able to obtain appointment as governor over the, quote, client kingdom of Gaul, that's modern France. Military victories, taxation, and pillaging followed, and Julius was able to simultaneously build enormous wealth and a fiercely loyal army. While events in the heart of Rome became more contentious, governors over other provinces and client kingdoms started slipping from the republic's control. Julius Kaiser was able to stir, quote, the hearts and minds of the plebeians, the bulk of the population, and main source of personnel for the military ranks. By the year we call 50 BC, Julius had quashed any and all resistance in Gaul, expanded the territory, invaded what is now Germany, and turned his eyes back to the enemies and the turmoil at home. Out of debt and now with a massive fortune, Julius had hired political agents or lobbyists in Rome to build favor and political connections. While some in the Senate wanted to quash his assignments to positions of power, Julius's allies were able to veto these attempts. On January 10th and 11th of 49 BC, Julius Kaiser led his Gallic troops across the Rubicon River into Rome proper, 
a violation against the law of raising private armies on the home turf. He commenced to kicking butt, clearing out all the Italian peninsula of his known political enemies. Julius Kaiser then did a tour of the client kingdoms and provinces, chewing bubblegum and kicking butt. And he was all out of bubblegum. Over the next few years, he quashed opponents across the Republic, <clears throat> was appointed to dictator, and set about to, quote, make Rome great again. However, the nobility and the Senate would have none of this populist nonsense taking their glory, so they assassinated Julius Kaiser in March of 44 BC. Due to Julius Kaiser's assassination, his work in firmly establishing the empire of Rome was cut short. In the resulting power vacuum, another series of civil wars again started up and lasted about 13 years. Through a lengthy series of battles, Kaiser's adopted son, his nephew, Octavius Kaiser, came out the supreme victor and in 27 BC, the Senate formally granted Octavius overarching power control over everything. They also gave him the title Augustus, meaning venerable. In modern English, we would call this Supreme Commander or Commander-in-Chief. The Constitution developed under Augustus set government with three basic divisions. Central, what we would call federal, the military, and provincial what we would call states or territories. Each of these government levels in turn had their own laws and protocols, although we're not supposed to exceed the bounds laid out constitutionally. Not having enough Roman manpower, the puppet government system established under the Republic continued. A local king or chief would pledge allegiance to Rome who would then help this leader put down their local enemies. As insurance to keep the puppet in power, Roman legions were deployed and stationed abroad in these client kingdoms. King Herod and Pontius Pilate are a prime example of such a relationship. And this map here covers when the Roman Republic became the Roman Empire. This also led to the historical period of time that is referred to as Pax Romana, Roman peace. Yes, there were continual little battles to tamp down, uppity malcontents to crush under the unwavering might of Rome. However, in the empire of Rome, there was 200 years without complete and total war. In other words, no nation against nation or kingdom against kingdom e.g. peace, peace. While all, quote, good things must come to an end, the empire of Rome fizzled out with corruption and compromise, new wars on multiple fronts. Until the arrival of Emperor Constantine in his adopting the claim to be, quote, the bishop of people outside the church. This would be the founding of what would become the Catholic, meaning universal, church seeking to tie it directly to Jerusalem, a connection to Revelation 11.8 and 17.18. Revelation 11.8, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Revelation 17.18, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. That great whore Babylon, riding the beast, holding the reins within her hands, guiding and directing it along its path until she gets bucked off. Next, we will take a look at casting off the great whore. All right. If you have any questions or comments, put them down below this video. 
and we'll address them as they come up. Uh, naturally, this is uh, heavily summarized. This is a series intending to show the connection in prophecy of the beast that then was and won't be for a while, but then its deadly wound is healed. Eventually, we're going to get to all the types for this and types for that as an homage that the, this beast is creating in its resurrection. So at any rate, I love you all. Tune in for the next one, Casting Off the Great Whore. I love you all.